This is a picture taken from one of the events that we from Nobel organized last year. And the, the person standing at the podium doing this is Shinya Yamanaka, the 2012 Nobel laureate and the inventor of the iPS cell, the induced pluripotent stem cell, which has a lot of potential to produce cures for disease. And in the picture behind him is a young man standing second from the left who has a disease called FOP, which is ossifying his connective tissue. And he is already very rigid, and he's not going to live very more, many more years. And he visits Shinya on a regular basis. And, and Shinya tells the story that every time he comes to visit, he does this. And initially, Shinya didn't know what that meant. Does that mean you're number one? Does it mean I'm the number one priority? No, what it means is anything you can do to help us one day faster would be just great. And I think that is a very nice message to introduce to the meeting and to the discussion, just to remind us what it's all about. So we can lose the picture now. Thank you very much. I've heard from all of you this morning, we've all heard from all of you this morning, how convinced you are of the advantages of molecular imaging and how innovations in molecular imaging are um, leading to it. Ever, ever more possibilities with the techniques. What, let's start by discussing what are the main barriers to the introduction of molecular imaging more widely, which of course has been touched on greatly. Now, I'd like to start, please, with um, Christoph Müller, who is the president of the European Association for Nuclear Medicine. We haven't heard from you yet, so would you like to comment on this? I think it's on. Just go. Okay. So, um, but indeed, I, I think we don't need any further, uh, but we need a lot of evidence, but uh, the we are convinced that there is a huge potential in, uh, for, of, for nuclear medicine, uh, especially in the field of radionuclide therapy. Um, and we have to... Uh, create the right conditions in order to accelerate and facilitate the access of our patients to these prom promising compounds. But there are quite some um, uh, hurdles to be taken. Uh, from a logistical point of view, um, we have to be sure that if we want to try to uh, introduce these new compounds into the market, that they will be available also in the future. So from, on the one hand, there is the production capacity. And there we have to make the right choices uh, about which isotopes we will use, which um, alpha emitters will be uh, widely available in the future, and what investments have to, to be done to make them available. Um, on the other hand, um, we have to deal with uh, the question on how to translate these new compounds from that are show very promising preliminary results. How can we translate these compounds that are currently tested and evaluated in preclinical trials and in early phase trials? How can we translate them to clinical trials and bring them as fast as uh, possible into the market? And we have a lot of potential in Europe, a lot of research um, done on radio pharmaceuticals. We are really in pole position in Europe. Uh, but most of these innovations come from the academic world, but the academic world has enough financing in order, to, in order to do these preliminary studies, but we don't have a financing to bring them to the market. So there, the interaction and the collaboration with uh, the industry is extremely important. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last point is the regulatory point, uh, and there we have um, the problem, well, it's not a problem, but we are facing radio pharmaceuticals. So on the one hand, we have radiation uh, regulations. On the other hand, we have pharmaceutical re re regulations that are not always compatible. Mm. And, uh, from the radiation and safety uh, side, we um, have uh, we have to deal with Euratom directives, um, where radionuclide therapy is considered as radiotherapy. 
And on the other, other hand, we have to comply with medi medi uh, med medication regulations uh, where we have to deal with where radio pharmaceuticals are considered as pharmaceuticals. So I will leave the, uh, the other. Uh, yeah, thank you. Answer. Thank you very much indeed. Vim, would you like to add anything to that as incoming president of the ENM? Well, I, I think uh, uh, Christoph's remark nicely summarized where we are. Let's say, what I like to emphasize is, let's say, it's all about collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say, for, first of all, let's say, the nuclear medicine community has to be very outward looking. So, from the discovery process, from the lab, until the further development, it involves a lot of stakeholders outside of the direct uh, commu nuclear medicine community. It's, um, uh, it starts with um, collaboration with uh, our clinicians, and that's important for molecular imaging agents, but even more so for anti-cancer drugs that we develop. Say so we have to position them right, and we have to move quickly, and without our referring physicians, it won't happen. Mm. Um, we have to work uh, with um, uh, with regulators. Um, it is, let's say, remarkable, like Christoph said, let's say on one hand, our radio pharmaceuticals are treated with drugs, and what we do is give subpharmacological doses in a one-off administration, and it's treated exactly the same in terms of manufacturing and formulation as drugs that are being infused in large quantities on a daily basis into patients. And um, see, I fully appreciate that what we do needs to be totally safe, but there is a bit of room for improvement uh, in uh, tailoring the regulations to a level that it's very, very safe, but prevents uh, the, the, uh, the amount of regulation resulting in costs that academia can no longer innovate. And when that happens, it becomes um, a bit of a problem because, like Christoph said, most of the innovation from nuclear medicine comes out of academia. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, I think uh, one of the, the main drivers of what we're doing is patient interest. We had a, a large conference organized by ENM on uh, developments in prostate cancer last month in Valencia. And we had patient representatives there and also uh, representatives from uh, patient-driven patient charities who support research. And the momentum that they created amongst the various medical professionals was enormous they basically said to us, hey guys, stop bickering and start working together and do something. And I think they're right. Say, it is about patience. And uh, if, if we take so long regulating and discussing, it will take way too long to, uh, to develop the things that the patients want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've, we heard from uh, Enat about how successful Israel is at building the local networks of people who need to talk to each other. Can you, is there anything in particular you would recommend to build trust on a wider basis? Um, I think, uh, let's say, the, uh, the Israeli model is uh, something that could and maybe should be explored on a national level. I think given the fact that in Europe we're not a country, but dealing with so many different healthcare systems, it may be very difficult to take that to the European level, but I think from a, from a concept to get things introduced, and there may be something on the back like is happening in the US, that you are obliged to demonstrate that what you have introduced while being in the healthcare system is effective. So maybe that is a better way forward than the German situation where you say, okay, no phase three trials, no reimbursement. Because uh, on one end, you see the UK, US situation where almost all good indications are reimbursed, and in Germany, just four. So what are, you doing, what are we doing to our patients? Mm. Does anybody want to pick up on that? There's another microphone here. Johannes, briefly. Yeah, I think we should all move to Israel. <laughs> 
because it's a, it's a, I think maybe this A because it's a small country and they don't have so much time to mess around. I think there cannot be too many round tables and these kind of things. You have to get stuff done. And, you know, it's a common sense approach and nobody's getting hurt. It goes into the basket. If it doesn't work out because it's not effective, it will just sit in the basket and nobody will use it. It's safe, we know that. And for the treatments, it's a little bit different. That's, of course, a, 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 a different concern. I'm, for the diagnostics, I would propose complete deregulation, absolute deregulation. Nobody needs reg regulation. It never was regulated. There's a very nice uh, essay in the Journal of Nuclear Medicine by Carol Marcus, who used to work with the FDA for a long time. And... Um, she essentially makes the point that what is done now in the U.S. with FDA regulation is simply done for financial benefit of the FDA because they uh, you know, ask for fees and you have to pay to get your imaging probes uh, through the process under many, many circumstances. She's also you know, proposing complete deregulation. It's safe. People can inspect the radiation issues anytime. But if you violate it, they should shut you down. It's pretty simple. But there's no reason to be concerned about anything other than radiation exposure of the population, and you record side effects. So, and just in, a, in the American context, is there any hope? If, do you think that there would be de deregulation? No. <laughs> but at least we should promote it, because we will at least you know, have a kind of an extreme demand. Because what Wim said is completely correct. It's, it's neither a, 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 a drug. No, it doesn't have drug-like properties. The radiation is also homeopathic. I mean, it has to be said. Radiation exposure from diagnostic nuclear medicine is nothing. Not dangerous for anyone. Mm. And I think we just need to promote that. Sorry, did you want to comment? Or? There's a microphone there if you want. Then we'll, then we'll come for questions. So I, I didn't talk about uh, therapy in the basket, if you noticed. But I think that you deserve a comment about this. Uh, well, PRT, the treatment for neuroendocrine patients, is already out there for 10 years. So by now, we know its place in the treatment approach of patients with metastatic neuroendocrine tumor. And with this regard, we, we know that at least one half of the patients, when, in one half of the patients, will make the disease chronic. I mean, in oncology, you not necessarily look at uh, treating the patient to the end. I mean, complete re response, but you would like to see him getting a chronic disease which is not going to kill him soon, okay? So with PRT, therapy for neuroendocrine tumors, which it's obvious already that it's there and extremely uh, beneficial, this one was introduced in the basket. Regarding prostate cancer, currently in the, in the basket we have radium-223. We not yet have lutetium PSMA, and I don't think that it will get that there that soon. And the reason is because, unfortunately, we offer the therapy very late in the course of the disease. I mean, we get the patients where there is nothing else to offer them. They are already after surgery or radiotherapy or hormonal therapy or chemotherapy. And as a last resort, when they are almost not staying alive anymore, then they are coming for tissue and PSMA. And of course, the results are not great at all. I'm afraid that it gives a bad name to this mode of therapy. Now, on the other hand, we're not yet ready to offer the therapy earlier in the course of the disease, we don't have enough, as for now, we don't have enough data to encourage us uh, offering the treatment as replacement for the more conventional ones. So I believe that with lutetium PSMA, although we see great cases where we do succeed, it's not yet ready to be introduced in any uh, universal basket. Yeah. yeah, I want also to stress, let's say, that molecular imaging agents are com something completely different than when we use nuclear medicine agents as therapeutics. Let's say when we develop therapeutics, let's say we still use the homeopathic uh, drug doses, but the amount of radiation that we're giving is specifically aiming at an anti-cancer anti effect. 
and we also will induce radiation um, effects on normal organs, and let's say that would be what is, could be considered the side effect of the drug. And let's say for therapeutics, we have to develop them according to oncological principles and show uh, that it is ben beneficial to take its place in the array of, um, of uh, uh, therapeutic agents that are available. And uh, because, we had a very nice discussion about that yesterday, because uh, many of the currently available agents aren't that great, let's say many of the hyped agents uh, have a response rate of patients less than 50%. Some of the agents that considered very good, only 20% of patients respond. So come on, if that's the competition, we should be able to beat it. But let's say then I'm not afraid to bring these agents into the arena of, um, of, of therapeutic drugs and let it show that it is equally good with less side effects and probably we will be able to show that it is better with less side effects and uh, with less burden to the patients to get the, th the effective therapy delivered. But let's say I have um, no interest in, and the ENM as, as an organization has no interest in cutting that process short in just bringing therapeutics to the market that are unproven. Let's say we, we do adhere to oncological principles that when we bring therapy to the patient, the therapy has to be safe and the therapy has to be effective. And I, I have no doubt that with uh, lutetium PSMA, we will follow the Luthathera and get a very effective uh, therapy out there. And I'm very happy that we work with industry to get the trials done to get pro uh, these drugs to the market. Thank you very much. Now, I'd, like, I'd love for the audience to be involved, so please, comments, questions, anybody? Every, Guy, please, the, could we have a microphone at the front, please? Just as a matter of history, you should know that when Thium was launched for uh, cardiac perfusions, uh, I remember a company that launched it in nine months, and at that time there was no regulations, which means that maybe if uh, we had regulation at that time, maybe nuclear medicine would not exist at the beginning. So just to prove the importance of regulation. To be honest, let's say if radiotherapy was invented, external beam radiotherapy was invented today, I don't think it would go, go past ethics approval. Yeah, please, Johannes, you, and please, more questions as well. So, so the study that would be nice uh, for, for PSMA, lutetium PSMA, would be take Gleason 8, 9, and then do adjuvant, uh, adjuvant lutetium treatment, randomize patients 50-50, uh, and uh, see what happens. I mean, that's, you know, that's fairly early disease. It's essentially what we do with high-risk thyroids. And I think that would be something that, so you do your prostatectomy and then randomize to, to, uh, uh, to lutetium PSMA treatment. And I think that could be something that has very interesting outcomes. Thank you. Please, yes, at the back. Kevin Cholton from the Nuclear Energy Agency again. Uh, completely different subject this time. <laughs> I'd like to take the opportunity to really thank uh, the efforts of Stefano and AAA in what they did in bringing forward the Lutathera product. I've been involved in nuclear medicine for over 40 years and uh, I saw uh, the very, very early days of uh, targeted therapy coming through, working with Krenning, and when Mallinckrodt had the so-called uh, um, uh, spirit group working where you had a fantastic group of people coming together. I actually uh, helped uh, Krenning uh, do the first uh, therapy outside of the Netherlands when we did one in the UK. I've, I've known for a very long time the fantastic effect that this type of product can have. And they face, at AAA, they face a huge hurdle because you have all these diagnostic products that keep getting better and better and better and the very earliest uh, peptides have been improved and improved and there's better products now and we're going to have better products in the future. 
if we really want to make nuclear medicine do the absolute best that it can do, you've got to find a way to let the diagnostic molecules get as far forward as quickly as you can, and that's by making the regulations uh, lean and mean and sensible, not uh, overly burdening. That way, you get the best opportunity of finding the really key products which allow you to go and take them to the therapeutic setting because the, the current therapy products, although they're really good and they look fantastic compared to some of the, uh, the chemotherapy products, I've worked in chemotherapy as well, and that's horrible. And uh, I'm not even happy at all about uh, seeing uh, the, the, the large number of immunology products that come in as cancer therapy. I have a friend who's got a type of lymphoma at the moment, and the first thing he did was nearly die when they gave him some of this stuff. I mean, I, I would really like to see the, the diagnostic side of nuclear medicine be able to move forward with the speed of the clinical chemistry that's out there today and to allow you to be able to pick the right products to take forward to the best therapy product at the time. And, and congratulations again to AAA for having uh, the, the, the strength to pick up on a product which was good. It's n never going to be, be the best. There's going to be better ones later, but taking a really good product at the time and taking it through to market and getting it there because this is what this industry needed and I hope everyone uh, gets behind that product and supports it, but I'd really like to see uh, the opportunity of the industry moving on even faster. Thank you. I'd also like to pick up on the comment that you made earlier about reimbursement and of diagnostics. Would anybody on the panel like to continue that discussion? In, I'll rephrase that. Who on the panel would like to continue that discussion? Christoph. Uh, I, I think reimbursement of uh, diagnostics is, is really an issue. And uh, when, when we look at the, the legislation on uh, radiopharmaceuticals and we see the marketing or organization or market, marketing authorization as a first pillar, clinical trials uh, legislation as a second pillar, and they are both covered by the European Union. On, on the other hand, you have the uh, magistral preparation, in-house labeling, uh, which is covered by national legislation. And what we see is that uh, in countries where um, this national legislation has uh, a balanced um, a solution in order to provide these new compounds in meeting high level standards uh, when it comes to quality and GMP standards, but uh, in countries that manage to have this uh, uh, balanced approach between the authorities and the scientific world, that their patients have access to these new uh, diagnostic uh, uh, compounds. Um, and it will be a challenge to find a balance also with the industry, because on the first, uh, these compounds are developed in the academic world, they're picked up by the industry, then they're launched, and then they're, they are in competition with these new molecules uh, from the academic world that are under development. So also there, I think we have to, uh, it's all about collaboration, it's all about communication, and um, if we want to find a solution on the European level, but as well as a national level, like the example of, the, uh, um, of Israel, uh, we have to put all stakeholders together and uh, look for a local situation and if possible, a global uh, uniform uh, situation for specific topics uh, at the European level. Yeah. yeah, I like very much what, what James said about the, the, the total market. Let's say what you see in nuclear medicine, and we're often blamed for it, is that we have one compound, and then before you know it, you have five similar compounds, which are maybe slightly better while we haven't finished evaluating the first. Look at what happens in the, in the cancer world. One drug comes out, within two years, two, three, four companies get a drug approved that hits the same target, may have a little bit of a different safety profile, a little bit of a different indication. So that, that Me Too registration of, dr of, of regular drugs is also seen in nuclear medicine, but the only problem is, is that the nuclear medicine radiopharmaceutical market is much smaller, so it doesn't support the commercial availability of four or five 
uh, octreotide co uh, compounds or four or five PSMA compounds. So we have to be ultimately conscious that if we bring something to market, uh, we cannot be constantly pushing for the next one that is a little bit better, that shows a little bit more targeting of the tumor, that shows a little bit better this or that. Say, we have to be conscious of the fact that as a community, we have to drive things to the market. On the other hand, I think it's fair to say that uh, the current situation makes it very difficult to get a competitively priced new radio pharmaceutical into the market. Um, say, nuclear medicine has a lot to offer, really a lot to offer. But say, for some big indications, the margin, for example, with what multiparametric MRI has to offer is, let's say, it's marginally better. And then it comes into play that when a molecular imaging test is three times more expensive, you have a lot more convincing to do to the administrators that the benefit is really there. So we have to be conscious of the fact that, let's say, competitive pricing of our technology is really important to advance the field. If we shoot ourselves in the foot and the, the, uh, try to get away with bringing very expensive diagnostics to the market, say the companies will be applauded that they have brought something to the market, but the community at large will not buy their product. So what happens? The companies get disappointed. Hey, there's no money in nuclear medicine. We bring something to them and it's not used. Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Totally different situation for therapeutics, but for diagnostics, we have to be confident in what we can do, but we have to be conscious of the environment that we work in. Okay, two quick comments on this from Johannes and Jim. Would you like? To so I think I not made the, the comment before that indium octreotide, at least in the U.S., is actually more expensive than than uh, net spot, and which is kind of ironic because it's really a lousy, you know, crappy thing to use but it is more expensive. So that's one point. It's actually more than $4,000 for an indium octreotide. The second interesting thing is we're treated like uh, uh, pharmacologic or, or pharma companies. The George, uh, George W. Bush, I think it was, or his father, I can't remember now, but uh, created a law that prevents Medicare, which is a government agency, to negotiate drug prices with companies, which in turn, of course, results in the fact that drug companies tell you how much the price is. Now, we can say that's really bad because that's why drugs are so expensive in the United States. Or we could say, well, if we are really drugs, then we tell them how much it is and Medicare would have to pay because we are treated like drugs. So I, I wonder whether we could use that to our advantage. One, one thing I'd like to add is uh, a note about Alzheimer's disease. So we have several FDA-approved, um, EU-approved diagnostic tracers for Alzheimer's disease, or at least for amyloid plaque deposition in the brain, which is adjunct to Alzheimer's disease. And um, reimbursement situation is, is very spotty for them at best. Uh, we do some clinical trials in the U.S., some larger trials uh, for coverage with evidence, and uh, there's a very diverse coverage situation around the world. Uh, understanding if a patient's dementia is Alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia can change the way the patient is handled and can make a difference in the, the years of their life that remain. But it's very clear we have a bunch of diagnostics there. We have a disease which, for which the prevalence is increasing. But the key, without uh, a therapeutic uh, for which we can use the diagnostic to triage it, the diagnostics still lack impact. Thank you very much. Any what, a last question from the audience, please? Richard Zimmerman, I'm just wondering if among the physicians that are around the table, they have a, a psychological uh, price they wouldn't go beyond 
uh, for a diagnostic. We, we saw these big figures for therapeutics, but we, we didn't see high prices for diagnostic. Is, is there any price that is too high for diagnostic? Uh, I, I would, uh, it's not about uh, psychology, it's just about um, uh, a business model. And um, we have to take in account that the global pricing, for example, in, in Europe for a, a PET CT scanner is about five, six hundred euros for the whole procedure. If you come at that moment with uh, uh, a diagnostic uh, compound that costs more than the procedure itself, it won't, won't work, that's, that's, that's obvious. Another thing that you have to take in account, obviously, is what is the impact on patient care. And um, it, it's difficult to convince the authorities about the cost effectiveness of an imaging compound. If you can prove that it significantly reduces the costs of subsequent tre treatments, and especially in oncology, these uh, um, anti-cancer drugs, yeah, then you might have a model where you could go a bit up. But the, the problem is that uh, you first have to prove that your molecular imaging is doing much better than the other conventional imaging techniques, like MRI, like, like CT. And then you have to um, uh, convince the authorities to pay this. You can't imagine, in, uh, I can't imagine in Europe that an imaging uh, a compound of 1,000 euros will be broadly used. And even if it comes to the market, then the national authorities or the European authorities will say, okay, you can use it, but in very specific cases. And then also, you don't uh, 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 get these products to the, the, you avoid the, a broad access of these compounds uh, to the patients. So, it's really an issue and it's really something that we have to think about. And maybe we have to reconsider the model and say, okay, we have all these facilities in Europe which that can produce in-house in a GMP way. And why don't we ask to the industry to provide generators in GMP conditions, provi to provide the precursors, to provide <coughs> the isotopes and these uh, synthesis models, and we go to a, a model where the universities and the big peripheral hospitals do the labeling on site and having paid all these pre precursors. It might be another model that might work. At least it has been shown in some of the countries where in-house labeling is possible uh, thanks to the uh, uh, so uh, if you, situation. So if you, if you average out Maybe someone knows the number here, I don't know it, but if you average out the costs per year for a neuroendocrine tumor patient, including initial surgery, medical treatments, you name it, symptomatic treatment that can happen, let's assume it's $50,000 per year, maybe, I don't know. And then you live 10 years, 15 years, $750,000, and during the time you get three PET scans or four, five thousand dollars each is twenty thousand compared to, to seven hundred fifty thousand that it costs. It's ridiculous. Its cost is not imaging cost is not an issue. They should image earlier, more often, high quality, as often as they can. We need to depart from this kind of we are the expensive ones because we are not. We are really not. You've just done the job I was going to ask you to finish with, which was I'd like people to think of summary sentences, because this is in part a public-facing face meeting. And I'd like to think of the, you to think just quickly of the message you'd like to deliver to the public. You've just delivered yours. Please. I, I just have a little comment. I'm slow and late like healthcare, <laughs> you know? And I have a comment on what James said two times ago. I mean, he was mentioning the <laughs> Alzheimer's not having... Uh, therapy and therefore diagnostics is of less, releva less relevance. I want to read him in a verse, like, you know. For me, and that's what I, my impression is that drug companies, in order to come out and start looking into drugs, they insist on having a non-invasive modality for imaging. So anytime somebody approaches us 
from the pharma of neurology diseases, including Alzheimer's, they will ask if we are, have the avail availability of amyloid imaging. Otherwise, they won't accept us for uh, to as well working together with them. So it's just the other way around, right? Thank you. Marcus? I just want to add, we, I think it's time to also uh, think about new role models for nuclear medicine. And we have, for example, the radiation oncology people who are performing kinds of companion use where they're using CT MRI for treatment planning. This is, in fact, what we're also doing. So we are using our Lutatati scans for planning of a Lutatera treatment, for example. And these guys have not really the problem of reimbursement we are talking about. So it's also a matter of how we sell our disciplines and how we use that. Also, if, if um, oncological treatment is associated with um, blood testing, for example, where targets are identified, these guys have no problem to implement this into the diagnostic al algorithms and they do also not have problems with reimbursement. So we, th we should think about novel methods to implement our uh, diagnostics into a whole treatment approach and to redefine our diagnostics, not, not necessarily as imaging, but as, as kind of molecular diagnostics. This is the point I want to make. Thank you. Andreas, would you like to make a final point? Yeah, sure. So I just remember that we are in Brussels today, and when I see the topic, it means management for European citizens. And my point is, so we are in a very lucky situation in Würzburg because we can offer PET to every patient. We get reimbursement for every patient, and there's a large growth. But I see that in other cities in Germany, it's the opposite. So they do only a little bit, and also other European countries, they even don't provide the PET uh, to all of the patients. And maybe we have um, an option here in Brussels to make a statement that the European Union can maybe contribute also to help us to do these uh, multicenter clinical trials. Thank you very much indeed. Wim? Well, for me, it's all about uh, the, the collaboration, working with the regulators, uh, getting appropriate, not over-regulation in place, appropriate regulation, working with the patients, to uh, identify uh, uh, where the, the clinical needs are, working with our clinical colleagues, and basically cutting time to clinical indications, clinical use short. Say, it's, I really, I was around for most of the time uh, when um, uh, the octreotides uh, or endocrine story developed. So I came to nuclear medicine in 1988, and that was when the first diagnostics were there. The first therapeutics were there in the early 90s. And now, uh, more than 20 years down the line, we have an approved product. Say, so I don't have 20 years of professional life left to see a, a, a PSMA agent or any other therapeutic agent come to market. So I really want to, to push, and uh, I'll say not just personally as a clinician and a scientist, but also, uh, let's say, uh, as a European organization of nuclear medicine, really want to push to work with all stakeholders to, uh, to get things tailored so we get the job done. Thank you. Christoph, do you want to comment? One quote, yeah. Oh, sorry? Oh, is there somebody in the audience who wants to make a comment? Okay, please, so go ahead, and then we'll just finish off here. It's Konrad von Bremen. I was just thinking, can we strengthen our alliances, our alliances with other clinicians as well as with health economists? Because there's so many of the examples we heard just would need to get additional emphasis by health economists. So why don't we let them help us to get evidence also on the economic side that we can show to the regulators and to our patients? Yeah, that's exactly exactly what we need, I think, um, uh, to involve all stakeholders that can help to um, uh, shape the best conditions for a bright future of nuclear medicine, and especially a bright future for our patients. Um, being a Belgian, a Belgian, I always see things in uh, 
uh, gastronomical context, but um, I, th I think that we have all, all ingredients are available uh, in order to guarantee this bright future of, uh, for patients. But uh, we will have to work uh, really as a team together with all possible stakeholders to make it a three-star menu. And that's what we will be working on at least from the side of the ENM in the next years. Yeah. Thank you. Jim? On the uh, non-medical side, the bringing the sciences to the aid of medicine, uh, we shouldn't forget the impact that the funding and the support of the basic sciences has for our industry. Uh, we are running out of people, honestly. And the problem is that we didn't create enough scientists in many places early on in the last 20 or 30 years. And we need to turn this around. And there has to, it has to be an attractive career. Uh, and in some cases, it's much more attractive to be a lawyer or an accountant than to be a scientist now. So I would say if we could do one thing that would help us, that would be it. So good call to arms. Yeah. Mine is a general one. It's the, close, <laughs> it's the closing point, Anna. <laughs> okay, so we are committed to our patients and we have to do, to, uh, do any effort we can in order to allow them to have a good quality of life and survive. Well, well said. Thank you.